Well, hey, everyone, thanks for joining us online, watching on YouTube, our Facebook page, or our website. Uh, and let me just add my uh, word of gratitude and praise to God, what you already heard from Pastor Bruce and from Kim Erickson. Just we're so thankful for your faithful generosity toward Naomi's house and the work that they're doing there. As you heard, God is transforming lives, and we'll continue to tell the stories of how your generosity is helping to transform lives, both at Naomi's house and with many of our Serve the World partners as we roll into the new year. And let me just add another word of great uh, gratitude and appreciation. Uh, from our general fund budget perspective, we finished the, the calendar year. Now, our fiscal year ends in August, but we finished the calendar year over $200,000 ahead of our budget goal to date. So again, thank you. Thank you to all of you who are faithful uh, to the mission of God here with your generosity financially. And just so you know, as we move into the new year and into the spring and begin to increasingly open all of our campuses and reopen all of our ministry programs, we, this helps us make wise decisions and move uh, with, with, with confidence in, uh, into all of those things that we're planning for. So thank you again for your generosity. Uh, let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, thank you as we stand just a few days into a brand new year. As we come together now to you and ask you to speak to us through your word, we, we always need to hear from you, but particularly right now. Many of us are happy to leave the year behind and trusting you for good things in the year to come. We ask you by your spirit would point us in the direction you want us to go as individuals and as a church family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, if you've been with us, you know the last couple of years, uh, the first uh, sermon of the new year, uh, we, we call Vision Sunday. And typically we talk about a question, th th who are we when we talk about vision? Who, who are we as individuals and as a church family? And in the past, we've looked at that question from one particular uh, question, one particular angle. You could really answer this question in two ways. First, where are we going? A directional uh, way of answering who are we. And we've talked about this in the past. We've talked about Fourth Campus and Neighborhood Church Vision and uh, name change. Uh, and that we'll do that again in the future, I would imagine. But this year, I want to focus on a different way of answering the question, who are we? What are we about? What are we, as a collection of people trying to follow Jesus, called the church, really all about? What's at the heart of who we are? And I hope, and I've been praying about this, and I hope that this sermon lives in your mind and hearts long after this particular uh, viewing and hearing. I know, I'm not naive enough to think uh, that everyone remembers everything that's ever preached. Frankly, I forget the things I've preached shortly after I preach them sometimes. But it's been my prayer that the things that we discuss, that God says to us today, would stay with us in the year ahead. Because I think they really matter. I know they matter to me, and I believe they matter to God, and he wants us to hear them. And so when you strip it all away, when you break it all down, what are we really all about? What makes the church different from any other nonprofit religious organization? What makes it unique, this collection of people trying to follow Jesus? Of course, we know the proper answer. You know the right answer. If you've been in church, you know the answer everyone always gives to any question asked in church. Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And we joke about that, but he is. And of course, we, we believe that. Jesus came to give his life uh, as a ransom for those to pay our penalty for sin, to set people free from their bondage and captivity to brokenness and sinful corruption, to bring us from darkness into light, from death into life, that his sacrificial death and his resurrection conquered sin in the grave. And that's our hope. And we preach about that all the time. But Jesus also called people to follow him. He preached a message of the kingdom. He said the kingdom life is available now and that his death and resurrection opened the way and he called people to follow him into this kingdom life. And this is what I want us to focus on today. Kingdom living in our cultural moment as people trying to follow Jesus in this day and age. What does the kingdom look like? What does it mean to follow him, to leave something behind, to turn and follow Jesus? And I want to take us to a passage in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus calls some of his first followers and learn from those stories about what it means to follow him today. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. 
for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, we're going to get into the calling of Matthew in just a few moments. But first, I, I, I want to draw your attention to who was upset with Jesus? Who was questioning Jesus in the story? And what were they upset or questioning him about? The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the religious insiders of Jesus' day were perpetually upset with him. Why? Well, you heard it in the question. Why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? We see this over and over and over again in the gospel accounts. In Luke 15, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. To sit down at a table and eat with someone was symbolically to say, I accept you. Jesus did this with apparently all the wrong people. He's preaching a message of the kingdom. In Mark chapter 1, we're told Jesus came proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. But according to the religious leaders of his day, he was including all the wrong people in his kingdom message. Now, Jesus was always, he was a controversial figure. He is now and he was then. But for two primary reasons, then and now, who he claimed to be and who he chose to include. Now, earlier in Matthew 9, there's a story where Jesus heals a, a man who's a paralytic. And when he heals him, he says to him, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees, same group, mutter to themselves, who does this man think he is to forgive sins? This is a question about who he claimed to be. Claiming to be the one who could forgive sins? That only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says effectively, you're right. So that you will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, to the paralytic, get up and walk. That's about who Jesus claimed to be. The next story, the calling of Matthew, is about who he, claimed, who he chose to include. All the wrong people, according to the religious insiders of his day. The reality is that Jesus introduces a whole new way of thinking about who is in and who is out. And his message and his mission and his life was shocking and scandalous and category-defying in the first century. And I believe it's equally category-shattering for us today, if we have ears to hear it. So to help us frame up this discussion, because it's, it's a little bit complicated, uh, and, and it takes some of us to really set aside some of our predispositions and our, our presumptions. I want to introduce you to a missiologist and a cultural anthropologist named Paul Hebert. This is Paul Hebert. I'll put his name up there so in case you want to look him up. He was born in India to missionary parents. He wrote lots of books, was highly educated in missiology, cultural anthropology. He was also had advanced degrees in mathematics. He was just one of those guys who's brilliant. He wrote The Gospel in Human Context. It's a wonderful book. And he, um, he began to, as he moved back into the, the West, wrestle with a question. He never gave up his faith. He loved Jesus, was committed to Jesus. But he wrestled with this question. Growing up in India and seeing the way his parents' generation and the missionary movement uh, of, of his era presented the Gospel in Christianity, here's the question. What does it mean for an illiterate Hindu peasant to become a Christian. How much does that individual have to know to follow Jesus? They have to know something. More specifically, how much of their old life and traditions do they have to leave behind? They have to leave behind something. But how much? Hebert came to believe that what was happening was that the, the Western missionary movement was, was uh, importing too many cultural requirements, too many restrictions that were not essential to the gospel. And he wrestled with this question and thought deeply about it. And he, and he imported a couple of concepts from mathematics to help uh, talk about this. Now, I know this is going to be abstract, so stay with me here. I promise if you hang in there, it'll, it'll help us. So uh, these concepts in mathematics, by the way, I, I do not understand. I've tried. I barely got through Algebra 2. I do understand how he applied them in the spiritual context, but maybe some of you math geeks out there will know what I'm talking about. The first thing he talked about was what's called a bounded set. Numbers or objects, in this case people, how are they identified? How, what is your identity? Who are you? Well, there's lots of ways you could answer that in relation to different objects or, or relation to different roles or that you play in life. But he talked about a bounded set, meaning Objects or people are defined by the boundary. In a bounded set, the focus is on the boundary. And things are either inside that boundary or they're outside that boundary. It's very clear. The boundary is clearly defined. All of the emphasis is on the boundary. And so in a bounded set, this is the point. Clear, clearly defining the line between who is in 
and who is out. Also in a bounded set, it's static. There's no movement. You're either in or you're out. So let's take an example like a family reunion. Uh, if you're going to inv invite people to a family reunion, how do you decide who gets invited? Well, your family. Well, who's that? Well, those who are biologically part of the family, adopted part of the family, maybe married into the family. Uh, you would not invite your next door neighbor to your family reunion. Why? They're not inside the bounded set. You get the idea? Now, spiritually speaking, and in Christian terms, many of us have grown up with a, a kind of Christianity that's like this. All of the emphasis is here on the boundary, being very clear about who is in and who is out. And we bring all kinds of things into this. We bring theological boundaries. You have to have your doctrine and theology right. We bring moral, behavioral boundaries, you know. There are certain things you cannot do or you must do. We bring even sociopolitical boundaries uh, into this. We make, we get really, we add and thicken this line, as it were, because we want to be sure about who's in and who's out. Now, the problem then with this approach is that the, the implication is if you're out here, you must change your doctrine, your theology, your traditions, your morality, your behaviors, maybe even your politics, if you want to get inside. But this is not exactly the way Jesus approached people. And so Hebert proposed another way of thinking about it called a centered set. In a centered set, the emphasis is not on the boundary, you can probably guess, the emphasis is on the center. So in Christian terms, the emphasis is on the center. Well, obviously Jesus, we already said that, is at the center. So objects are known in their relationship to the center because that's the focus. That's how we define who's a Christian is their relationship to the center. And by relationship, we don't just mean proximity. We mean movement or trajectory. So you're either moving toward the center or away from the center. And that's how we talk about it. Those moving toward the center or those moving away from the center. In a centered set, the focus is on the center and it's dynamic, not static, meaning there's movement. Now, there are boundaries. It's not as if anything goes. It doesn't matter what you believe or how you live. That's not the case. But the boundaries are not the focus. The focus is on Christ at the center. And so somebody could be outside of the moral political, uh, even doctrinal boundaries, meaning they don't know all that much yet. They, their life hasn't been transformed yet. They maybe even are coming out of a lifestyle that's totally antithetical to the gospel. But something's happening in their mind and their heart, and they're moving toward Jesus. Is that person a Christian? Conversely, somebody who's maybe inside of the moral, religious boundaries, but their heart is far from Christ, and they're actually moving away from him. Which one's the Christian? In a bounded set, it's clear who's in and who's out. And there's a place for this. There are boundaries that matters. But in a centered set, it's a little messier socially. It's not always as crystal clear. And actually, when we come to the stories of the Gospels, that's exactly what we get. We don't get neat, clean lines about who's in and who's out. It's a little messier. It's not as always as crystal clear. And Hebert came to believe, and I 100% agree, that the centered set is the better approach to understanding who Jesus is and what he's all about, what his message and mission really is. A person's beliefs and behaviors in a centered set change as they move toward the center. So it's not that nothing, no, nothing is required, there's no change required, but instead of out here, you must change to get in. It's as you move toward Jesus, you begin to change your thinking, your morality, your behavior, all manner of things begin to change about you. Again, we'll come back to this in just a moment. But let's take us now to a quote from Hebert, which makes this a little clear in, in print. Hebert gives us this quote from an essay he wrote called Culture, uh, uh, Conversion, and Cognitive Development. A brilliant essay. Uh, and we'll we'll uh, post a link that you can look that up. But here's what he says. Two important dynamics are recognized. First, there is conversion which in the centered set means the person has turned around. The biblical word for that is repentance. And he has left another center or God and has made Christ his center. 
So the first movement is to turn around. You're headed one way, you turn around, and now you're headed which, another way, which direction, toward Jesus. This is a definite event and a change in the God in whom he places his faith. Next. Secondly, and by definition, growth is equally an essential part of being a Christian. Having turned around, one must continue to move towards the center. There is no static state. Conversion is not the end. It's the beginning. I love that. Conversion is not the end. It's the beginning. We need evangelism to bring people to Christ, but we must also think about the rest of their lives. We must think in terms of bringing them to Christian maturity, in terms of their knowledge of Christ and their growth in Christ's likeness. Hebert came to believe, as I said, and I agree, that the center set approach is the best way to understand the gospel message. Now, again, it's messier, but it's what we have actually in the gospel accounts. Think again for a moment about Matthew. Sitting there at his tax booth, and Jesus comes to him and says, follow me. You've got to, you've got to imagine Matthew sitting there at his tax booth. There, there is not a, a picture of a person further away from the center in a bounded set mentality. On, from a moral perspective, we've talked about this a couple of weeks ago. If you were here when, in the sermon on Zacchaeus, the tax collectors were absolute moral outsiders of their day. They were Jews who collaborated with Rome. In fact, to the Jewish worldview, Matthew sitting in his tax booth represents everything that's wrong with the world in that day. He's the problem because he should know better. He's extorting and exploiting his own people with the backing of the hated Roman military. And Jesus calls him, and he begins to move toward Jesus. It's, it's a stunning situation here. When Jesus called Matthew to follow him, he was as far outside as you could get. In fact, let's go back to that drawing for just a moment. Where we, would we put Matthew? We would put Matthew, I think, he's, he's, he's this guy. Matthew is absolutely an outsider. Far outside of the religious, moral, social uh, inner circle of his day. And yet Jesus comes to him, moves toward him, and calls him. And Matthew becomes one of Jesus' quote-unquote inner circle. He's the author of the very gospel we're reading the story from. He's one of the disciples, one of the twelve, the inner ring, as it were. In fact, if we go back uh, to the gospel for just a minute, and we look at Matthew chapter 10, this is the next chapter. We're given a, just a little account of the 12 disciples Jesus called. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. I want to focus on those two names for just a minute. Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. It's no accident that we're given a little bit of biographical detail there about those two men. Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. Well, we know about tax collectors. What are zealots? We don't use the word zealot very much or zeal. Uh, we think of religious fanatic. In Jesus' day, think religious fanatic with a sword. They were absolutely fanatical about their, the Jewish faith, and they hated the Roman Empire, and they were willing to do whatever it would take to destroy Rome, to kick out Rome uh, from Israel, uh, even if it meant violent overthrow. They're zealots. Uh, there were uprisings and revolts, and, and Simon is part of this movement. He's part of a movement to overthrow the Roman occupation and the government. Uh, top of their list of hated individuals would have been tax collectors, those who collaborated with Rome. They were worse than Romans because they should know better. You could not pick two people more diametrically opposed in that culture than a tax collector and a zealot in the Jewish context. Do you think it's an accident Jesus called them both to follow him? No, nothing Jesus does is an accident. Think about it for just a minute. These two men, who one is an insider, absolutely, one is an outsider, and yet Jesus says both to both of them, follow me. In their old life, they would have nothing to do with each other. Simon would have been very hostile toward Matthew. And yet Jesus says to both of them, follow me. Jesus is redefining the categories. He's redefining what it means to be in the family, in the kingdom of God. 
All of the categories are going to be different from this point forward. Let's go back to our drawing again for a moment. And if we were to say, this is Matthew, well, this is Simon. Right, here's Simon, and here's Matthew. And what happens is both are called to move toward Jesus. And in moving toward Jesus, they're moving toward each other. You see what Jesus is doing here? It's, it's, it's profound in that day, and it's happening still in our day. All that matters is not your past life, not your religious pedigree, not your family of upbringing, not your past sins or past brokenness or past achievements. What matters is how you respond to the call of Jesus and do you start moving in his direction. As you do, you begin to slowly come inside new boundaries. You think different. These two guys think very different. They're going to be aligned in some way. I'm not suggesting they're, all, they're going to be perfectly aligned in everything. I'm guessing that even following Jesus, Simon and Matthew had different sociopolitical views. They didn't perfectly align about everything. But as they came closer and closer to the heart of Christ, they became closer and closer to each other. And those differences became less and less significant as they came inside the boundary, as their lives began to change. And that's God's vision still today. Not just once upon a time. And then there's the case of Judas Iscariot. We didn't mention him. He's mentioned in the text. This is the one who would betray him. Think about this. Where is he? Well, he's about as insider as you get. And yet, he's moving away from Jesus, but nobody knew it. Only Christ. Only Jesus knew that. So you see what, what's happening here. A few more observations about the story of Matthew 9. Uh, in verse 10, we're told that Matthew is at a dinner, uh, has a dinner party. Jesus calls Matthew. Matthew decides to follow him. Uh, and he, he throws a dinner party and invites Jesus and all of his friends. The friends are referred to as many tax collectors and sinners were there with him. I, I, this is just an aside, but I can't help thinking about Simon. <laughs> He's at this dinner party as well. What is he thinking? There's more of them? He's, we're having dinner with more of them? He, he looking around, but he's following Jesus. And that means following Jesus to the kind of people Jesus cares about. And it's defying his categories. Anyway, Jesus is at this dinner table. He's having this dinner. And Matthew invites his friends. Now, Matthew has made the decision to follow, which means he's leaving behind his old life. Let me put it this way. He's now seeing that following Jesus, moving his direction, means my old life with all of its compromise and corruption and brokenness and sin and betrayal is not compatible with going Christ's way. I have to turn from this and leave this behind. And as he does so, he, he wants to tell others about this, and so he throws a dinner party and he invites his friends. But his friends aren't, aren't the Jesus type, at least according to the religious leaders. They're not kingdom people. But he, that's all, those are his friends. So he invites them over, and Jesus comes to his house and has dinner with his friends. Here's a question. Do you think those tax collectors, sinners, moral and religious outsiders who were at that dinner party, do you think that they knew that Jesus probably did not approve of their lifestyle? That Jesus did not agree with the choices they had been making? You think they knew that? Of course they knew. Of course they knew that. And yet, they still wanted to be with him, to be near him. That is so convicting to me. Is that true about you? Is it true about us as a church? Are there people in your life that know what you stand for and what you're about? And they would know, even though it's not been spoken, they know that part of the way they've been living, you wouldn't agree with but they still are attracted to Christ in you? They still want to be near you? This is amazing. I think that's God's vision for us. That's his plan for us. But the Pharisees can't handle this. They just don't have any categories for this. They can't process it. They can't deal with it. In fact, they, they don't know what to do, so they don't even ask Jesus. They ask his disciples. Did you catch that? They go to his followers and say, what's the deal with your master? Why does he do this? Because they just can't even, they have no framework for understanding this. They think only in this way. And it makes no sense to them. I hope you see how truly powerful and profound this is. Implications for us for what it means to be followers of Jesus. Let me go back for a moment to a, a, another Paul Hebert quote.
This next quote, Hebert says, if we were to define Christian as the centered set, remember his question, how do we understand illiterate people from a different culture and background becoming Christians? What does that mean? If we were to think in terms of a centered set, the critical question is not what people know, although they obviously need some knowledge, but have they made Christ their God? This is the question. Do they seek to follow Christ and to know him more fully? That's the question. The question is not who's in and who's out. The question is not do you conform to all of the boundaries. The question is, have you made Christ your God? And have you begun to move toward him? Think about this for a moment. One more time, back to the drawing. I know we're jumping around here a lot, but I kind of like to play with the magic board. I don't know where you see yourself in these drawings. Perhaps you grew up like this and you feel like you're on the inside. You, 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 for the most part, you're not perfect, but you, for the most part, you believe the right things and do the right things. Or maybe you feel like somebody way out here, like you've been an outsider your whole life. You've always been on the outsider, specifically religious outsider. Maybe the, the church has always been a hard place for you because you've been made to feel less than or it's looked like a bunch of hypocrites who are angry and you just feel on the outside. You're not sure you even want to be on the inside. The, that's not the question. The question is let's not keep adding uh, let's not keep adding to these boundaries. That's our tendency, to thicken up these lines, to add these, to these boundaries. The question is, are you moving closer to Christ? Now, if you are, it will eventually, inevitably, require reframing of how you think about your identity, about uh, your morality, about the world, about all kinds of things, and it'll change your behavior. But Jesus is not saying, Clean up your act, and then you can come inside. You know, very often, I'm asked by people, well-meaning people who love, love God, Pastor Jeff, why don't we preach more about the boundaries? They don't say it that way, but they say things like, we need to preach more about issues of today, issues about, of abortion. Why don't we talk more about the right to life? Why don't we talk more about God's vision for marriage and sexuality? Why don't we preach more about uh, racial reconciliation? And these things matter, and we have talked about them, and we will again. I don't want you to misunderstand. We're not afraid to talk about issues. But very often we turn those issues into the boundaries by which we define who's in and who's out. If you ever wonder why we preach so much about Jesus, why we talk so much about the gospel, why every sermon seems to tip toward him, this is the reason. Because quite frankly, this doesn't change people's lives. He does. And it, with all my heart, I believe that what God wants for us as a church both individually and collectively, is for us to be moving closer to the heart of Christ. As we do so, he will begin to reorient how we think about all manner of issues. And again, the issues matter. But Christ is infinitely more valuable for all of us. It's so easy to get distracted and be tempting to focus on the boundaries. I think we as a church and each of us as individuals need to continually recenter our lives on Christ. In fact, you know, we're just a couple of days into the new year. It's not unusual for people to pick a word uh, to focus on for the new year. Uh, I have no good friends who, who are, love Jesus and they, and they pray and ask God for a theme, a word for the year. And that's a wonderful practice and discipline. But whatever word God does or does not give you, it, it's of no value if it isn't bringing you closer to Christ. This is the time people make resolutions, all manner of resolutions. Perhaps all of us need to lay some of those things aside and say, God, let this be the year that I grow closer to you than ever before. Let this be the year that I begin to move closer to the heart of who you really are and what you really want with me. You could do no worse than that for a goal for the new year. In fact, let me give us a couple of questions to focus on two primary or, or, or critical questions here for the new year. In fact, these really are for the new year. Who or what have you placed at the center of your life? Well, this has been what I've been wrestling with personally in my own life, in our family, and in our church family. During this, this season we've endured and are still in the midst of, the calendar hasn't changed it. I've been asking this question. God, am I in danger of putting other things at the center and, and moving you to the margin? 
This is a question you should be asking yourself, not just today, but every day, all year long. And then second, what's the trajectory or direction of your life? Is there a movement? Remember, a centered set is dynamic. There's movement involved, and that's what matters. Am I moving closer to Christ? It doesn't mean I'm perfect, and quite frankly, for many of us, it's one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. It's fits and starts. We're not perfect. It's not always up and to the right in our spiritual lives. But the question is, am I growing? Am I moving closer to Christ? What a great way to measure this next year. The, the, the vaccine, the pandemic, the economy, the government, the education system, schools, all that matters, and, and we should be watching all of that. But the best metric for us this year would be to ask this question, am I moving closer to Jesus? Am I becoming more like him in the way I think and the way I live? That's our question. And what better way for us to finish up this, this first sermon of a new year and talking about moving to, closer to Jesus than to celebrate communion. We're going to do that in just a moment. In fact, most of you hopefully have your elements ready, but if you don't, now's the time to, to grab a bread and cup and get, get ready because I'm, I'm going to pray and lead us through the elements together. But this simple act that Christians have been observing down through the centuries of drinking of the cup and of taking of bread really is meant to recenter us. It's, it's, God gave it to us as a way for us to bring our lives back to center, to him to move closer to who he is as we remember his sacrifice, the price paid for us, the depth of his love. And we join with Christians all over the globe and throughout history. And that's why it doesn't matter if you're part of our church family, members or not, if you know Jesus, if you have, in the words we just read, made that turn, turned around, and made the decision, Christ, you are my center. I, sometimes I forget it, sometimes I drift, sometimes I'm prone to wander, but you are the center of my life. I've made you my God then you're welcome as we celebrate communion. Let's pray together as we prepare. Father in heaven, we pause now to acknowledge that you alone are God and you are good. And no pandemic or uh, unrest or politics could ever change that. Forgive us for thinking otherwise. Thank you that on the threshold of this new year, as we look forward in hopeful anticipation, you, Jesus, are recentering us, bringing us back to who you really are. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for these simple elements of bread and cup which you've given us to remember who you are. Lord, as we receive these now, we bring our hearts back to center. We confess that we have wandered. We have made other things, put other things at the center of our lives. Forgive us by your grace, we pray in your name. Amen. If you're ready, take the bread now that you have. Hold it in your hands, pass it to your, your friends and family that may be with you. And I remind you that Jesus said he is the bread of life. On the night of his betrayal, he took bread and broke it and passed it to his disciples and said, this is my body and it is given for you. Eat this in his memory. The scripture says that after they, the disciples, had finished eating, Jesus poured out a cup and he passed it among them. Remember, Simon the Zealot, Matthew the tax collector, Judas Iscariot, all of them were there. We're there. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember his sacrifice and his love for you. Friends and family, brothers and sisters in Christ, may you go on this new year in the grace of Jesus. May you make him the center of your life. And may he be the answer to the question, what you are all about. Amen. And happy new year, everyone.